my observations is that whenever uh, we talk about welfare issues within the zoo world, there are some people who immediately get uh, extremely uncomfortable um, and, and very intentionally use some words which are very charged. And it's not about um, uh, activists, it's not about advocates, it's, it's immediately extremists. Um, and it's very intentional because that kind of word marginalizes somebody. I mean, most humans, when you hear that somebody is an extremist, <laughs> you know, you want to step away uh, because you might as well call them uh, nuts if you, if you say they're extremists. Uh, which I think is a very unfortunate, but as I said, I think it's very intentional. And I'm, I'm kind of hoping that those of us in the zoo world, and there are quite a few leaders here today, We'll really listen for that and we'll talk to our colleagues when we hear it so that we stop that. Um, and it doesn't happen everywhere. You know, you go to England and when people speak up about important uh, welfare con uh, concerns, whether it's in zoos or whether it's uh, in, in, well, they're, no, they're called enthusiasts, wildlife enthusiasts. But, but we, for some reason in the States, and, and again, I think it's intentional, they're, they're called extremists. And I think that <clears throat> is a terrible disservice. Uh, I also think, um, I mean, certainly in, in the many years that I taught within AZA's management school and, and then at MSU, I always used to, used to begin by asking people, who's PETA? And you'd, everybody would go, oh. And I would go, no. You know, Who's PETA? And people, okay, it's PETA for the ethical treatment of animals. And I would go, so if you work in a zoo, aren't you a person for the ethical treatment of animals? I mean, honestly. So we, we have to stop marginalizing people that actually challenge uh, this notion that we're the experts. And we are experts, but we're not the only experts. And our expertise is not in all arenas. And, and the reality is that when you come to these meetings, when you go to AZA and you hear from HSUS and, and Born Free and some of the other organizations, Andrew or Wayne Paselli or Laura Maloney or a number of other people that have come, you're not listening to extremists. You're, you're listening to people who are incredibly knowledgeable and are trying to advance things. And I think sometimes we come across uh, as often a lot of professions do, is being terribly arrogant and closed-minded. Uh, and I think we, we got to take a deep breath here. And it's, you know... So that leads into uh, um, the next speaker, Chris Draper, uh, who has been um, engaged with us for a number of years, born free, uh, again, within the zoo community, in, in a general sense, has been perceived as extremists and as, as enemies. I don't know about you, but I think the reason I do what I do in life is largely because of Born Free. Uh, the book, uh, Joy Adamson and, and that whole trajectory, um, you know, some people think that the way you connect, uh, Keith mentioned this yesterday, is, is directly through catching animals and things, and, and that certainly happens. There are other people that are greatly moved by movies, by books, um, and for me, uh, Born Free was a critical moment in my childhood. Uh, and Born Free, in our view, for a long time, un until uh, I got much better connected to uh, Humane Society of the United States, where I found out that they do, um, well, actually, they do as much conservation work as AZA does especially if you pull out WCS, which is responsible for half of all expenditures in AZA conservation. Um, but Born Free was an organization that we felt was just like us, absolutely committed to both conservation and, and to welfare and refusing to say one at the expense of the other. So I have enormous respect, uh, even though at times, both to us and to, to others in the zoological community, They've been very directly critical. I think they do tremendous work, and I think we need to listen. So with that, Chris Draper, please welcome. Thank you for that introduction, Ron. That's, um, well, it's certainly set me a challenge. I, I'm not here to, to challenge anything, or at least not 
until the very end of my presentation. Um, I, uh, I'm here to talk about compassionate conservation, but I should first say thank you very much, obviously, to Ron, to Steph, and to Scott for organizing what I'm going to say is yet another absolutely amazing um, symposium. Uh, the quality so far has been awesome. It's about to get much, much worse. Um, so bear with me. But we've heard this term, compassionate conservation, used several times over the last sort of day, uh, day and a bit. Uh, and it's my job, I hope, to try and expand upon what we mean by that. Um, the subtitle might give you a bit of a clue, animal welfare as a central consideration in conservation. I don't know about you, but when I'm reading papers related to animal welfare, as I do you know, in my spare time, um, I tend to skip over the first couple of introductory paragraphs. It's very naughty of me and I shouldn't do it, but those are the paragraphs where you, they, they set out the definition of animal welfare. But the thing is, in discussions such as we're having it over these days, it's absolutely critical to get to the, to the nub of what we mean by animal welfare. And I think that was done so well yesterday by David Fraser and his, his, uh, present, his awesome presentation. I'm going to, with that risk of, of coming up very short of David's introduction, just skim over in a few words what I'm talking about when, I mean it, when I'm talking about animal welfare. The OIE has adopted this, so that's the Organization for Animal Health, has adopted uh, this definition of animal welfare, which means how an animal is coping with the conditions in which it lives. Importantly, they've focused on what it means to have a good state of welfare, which I think is quite a, a key part of any definition. Um, it has a good state of welfare if it's healthy, comfortable, well-nourished, safe, able to express innate behavior, and if it's not suffering from unpleasant states such as pain, fear, and distress. Most of these definitions, as we learned from David yesterday, come from the farm animal uh, research that's been done, to a certain extent, laboratory animal research. Um, another take on it from Marion Dawkins. Are the animals healthy? Do they have what they want? These are questions to ask when you're thinking about an animal's welfare. John Webster, again, summarizes it in, in a slightly different way. Good welfare is fit and feeling good. I mean, I, I think that's quite a nice aid memoir of how to consider an animal's welfare. But what's, again, coming from the farm animal, com uh, farm animal community, so that's from the Farm Animal Welfare Council, or committee as it now is, uh, in the UK, is this concept of a life worth living. Um, does, an anim does an animal have a life worth living? If it, if it has good welfare, there's every chance that it does. I think when we're talking about wild animals, um, wild animals in captivity, but also wild animals in the wild, w it's a useful thing to have at the back of our mind, that are they having a life worth living? So that's the introductory paragraph, so you can start paying attention now. Um, conservation biology. In the same way that we've touched on what animal welfare is, I want to touch on what conservation biology is. Um, we're all very, very familiar with, um, yeah, there we go, right, with uh, the idea of um, conserving genetic material. Um, even in the zoo world, there's a great focus on ensuring uh, s sustainability of populations at a genetic level. Um, Obviously, many, many conservation efforts are attempted at the habitat and ecosystem level, you know, the sort of broad scale stuff. Um, generally speaking, historically, we've tended to overlook the level of the individual in conservation. Not exclusively, but in, in, a, in a very broad assessment. And personally, I think that's been an oversight because they're an integral part of this, this scheme, this process, this, this interrelationship. So, why is, why is that? Why are we dealing with conservation biology as a separate entity to animal welfare? In part, you could probably trace it back to the introductions to conservation biology from Michael Soule's groundbreaking, uh, well, landmark paper in, uh, in the 80s uh, entitled, What is Conservation Biology? And where he summarizes in this, um, well, just basically, th this is what he considers all the issues that feed into conservation biology and what they are. And to be honest, with the exception perhaps of, of also physiology, the only one that really might encompass something approaching something to do with animal welfare is veterinary medicine. However, Sule specifically makes a distinction between the two, saying that conservation and animal welfare, however, are conceptually distinct and that they should remain politically separate. I understand he's softened his view uh, since ever so slightly, but that's, the pre that's what it started off with. So conservation was set up, conservation biology was set up 
entirely distinct from animal welfare. And I think what we're seeing now, what I hope we're seeing now, is a realization that that is a bit of a, a bit, a bit illogical, a bit of a fallacy, and that there's much to be learned by, well, from both disciplines uh, inter interacting with each other, and perhaps uh, a, a more synergistic approach needs to be adopted. Okay, conservation. You've seen, I'm sure, pictures like this. I, I choose this just as an, as an abstract example. This is the, the deforestation of Borneo. Um, and it, this is the sort of way that these things are presented to the public as an infographic, something that shows the, 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 the hor horrifying um, decimation of, of forests across the island. Um, and I look at that, and I'm sure you do, and your heart sinks, and you think, goodness me, that is awful. We, we really should do something about that. Another way these sort of concepts have got across is, is, is a more visual thing. So I look at that again, I get the same emotion. I think, gosh, that really is awful. Um, but it doesn't give you the scale that it's happening on. Another way of presenting this information, again, t entirely abstract, just not, not specifically important what we're focusing on here, is this sort of graphical representation. And you look at the decline in tiger numbers um, over from 1970 to about present day, and you see it's an obviously horrifying decline. And along the way, you're seeing the, the, the extinction of various subspecies. And again, it leaves you fairly hopeless. But what I, I think perhaps is missing from all of this is the, the actual toll on individual animals, the suffering that's involved in those declines. In those, you know, a graph cannot get across to you that each and every one of those animals almost certainly died, well, they, they did die, and they almost certainly died in a very unpleasant way caused by human activities. Um, I choose these pictures not to shock, but just to counterpoint the forest destruction. We need to conceptualize that with human-influenced habitat destruction or human influences on the environment comes great suffering at an individual animal le level. And it's something that took me quite a long time to grasp. I'm sure all of you guys are way ahead of me in that, but I, you know, I just wanted to spell it out in no uncertain terms. Again, you know, habitat destruction leads to, to wildlife not having enough habitat. Um, wildlife goes looking for food sources. Humans, in ever-increasing numbers, have easily accessible livestock. Leopards, such as this poor individual, end up becoming livestock predators and meet a grizzly end at the hands of humans immense suffering as a result of a conservation problem. The bushmeat trade, everybody's familiar with it as a conservation problem. You, you talk about great apes, you talk about primates in Africa, you hear people say one of the greatest threats is the bushmeat trade. What you, well, perhaps people, well I certainly I didn't, was conceptualize the suffering involved in the bushmeat trade as well as the conservation threat. I knew that it was a threat to numbers, what I ha wasn't conceptualizing is that it involves so much suffering as well. Animals are, are suffering and dying, and not just target animals. I have to say, these are horrible pictures, but I don't know about you, having seen the pictures that Dave Neal showed from uh, the zoos in China, I mean, <laughs> not sure who's got the most gr gruesome pictures, really. Um, so, we've seen, I hope, that anthropogenic impacts on animals and the environment, um, that there are conservation impacts and welfare impacts joined together. That's one of the key tenets of what I'm trying to get across in terms of compassionate conservation. But what about welfare impacts in a conservation context? What, what about the, the effect we have on animals' welfare when we try and carry out conservation activities? You know, but we're trying to save populations and habitats. Are we doing that with no effect on animal welfare? Well, I think, again, to il illustrate how I came to thinking about this, um, I was at a presentation uh, at a zoo in the UK and the, uh, a project in West Africa, again, it was a bushmeat project, that was proposing um, to ameliorate the um, threat to primate populations by providing local people with an alternative protein source. And you think, oh, that sounds like quite a good trade-off. And then they announced that what they were doing was starting the, this, this intensive farming of a wild species, which is the grass cutter or cane rat. Um, and I was just thinking to myself, well, we've got a situation where you've got a conservation problem. You've got a threat to the conservation of primates. You've got a, a welfare consideration as well as part of that, but no one seems to be addressing that. But the solution seems to be to create a situation where animals are going to suffer. 
And to me, that didn't seem like a fair solution or a proper solution to the problem. So thinking about it in a more, maybe a more refined way over the recent years, got me to, to realize that in terms of what we do in, in the name of conservation research, a lot of these activities can have a negative impact on animal welfare, even though we're doing them ostensibly for, for good conservation, sound conservation reasons. A, a, you know, a very common practice is the use of tags um, and capturing, capturing wild animals in order to, to tag them or mark them in some way. This is a, a vervet from a project that I think Born Free was involved in, and he's just waking up from anesthesia. Anesthesia is a, you know, he would have been darted or, or caught then darted. Uh, anesthesia is a stressful process. He's coming around probably from, uh, you know, ketamine, which can be a very scary experience for some animals. He's got a new uh, tag in his ear and he's got a, a radio collar on. All of these things are going to have some impact on his survivability and his interactions with members of his own species and his behavior and to some degree his welfare. This is uh, uh, the site of where a, a, a semi-permanent tag was attached to the dorsal fin of a dolphin two weeks after it fell off. Um, you can see that there's you know, what looks like infected tissue there. Um, even benign activities done in the name of conservation have so often got a welfare component that is not really being considered very well or hasn't been considered very well. Okay, conservation practice. So we've had the research. What about what are we doing in the name of conservation? Well, one of the biggest threats to seabird communities is introduced species and invasive species such as rodents. And the techniques involved, unfortunately, are quite gruesome in controlling the, the in this case, rat numbers, the use of poisons and traps. They're not always effective. They're certainly not always humane. And we're dealing with a scale of suffering, on, well, it's, it's a scale that's absolutely immense, but it's being done for an ultimately good purpose, you know, a, a societally good purpose of conservation of, an, of another species. We have, we're dealing with a, a trade-off here that hasn't really been fully explored, in my opinion. Even activities that are relatively benign, you think, like translocation, we're just moving an animal from one place to another. In this case, this giraffe gets you probably can't see, but he's been darted, so that's just a short, sharp, you know, poke on the butt. Um, but the trouble is something like that ends up with a stressful process such as this, of a sedated giraffe being loaded into a crate and shipped many, many miles by road, all in the name of conservation. And then, of course, captivity. It would be remiss of me not to bring it up here, there, and I will touch on it at the end of the, of the presentation, that, you know, captivity, zoos, there is a, um, a stated aim for conservation in, all, in, in the zoo, un, uh, the zoo uh, community. How does that reconcile with the welfare of the animals kept in zoos? So we have a situation where historically conservation and animal welfare have been seen as distinct. And I think this quote here ex is, exemplifies it nicely, where the conservation clock is running out, and in some cases, to appease all the ethical sensitivities that surround the study of wild animals threatened with extinction, may have to be forgone. This was a quote from, a, a, I believe, an Australian researcher on marine mammals um, in relation to the use of hot iron branding on marine mammals in um, Antarctica. If you don't know what I mean by hot iron branding, that's what we're talking about. Uh, that's probably quite a severe example where the animal is marked permanently using something that I think you can probably intuitively tell is potentially very painful, um, and they're marked to be identified at a distance. Um, Kristen Walker, who was one of, I believe, one of David's, uh, David Fraser's uh, students, kind of did some great research looking at the effect of hot iron branding in terms of the behavior and welfare of the animals after the brand. The problem being, of course, is that you're having an impact on the study animals that you're talking about. Um, and the tr also, it's leading to these sort of polarized positions where conservation is too important for us to worry about the ethics of animal welfare. And I don't think that that is a defensible position. Okay, other things to consider in, in this sort of interface between con conservation and animal welfare. This was a, 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 a review of the literature carried out by some researchers at the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit in Oxford, looking at keywords in, in articles relating to reintroduction and translocation. And you can see that, as I, I think is, is absolutely right, success features, the word success features uh, very, very highly 
as does cost, relatively speaking, because that is an important consideration in, in a, a conservation activity such as reintroduction. But as you can see, things like welfare, things like stress, things like ethics are mentioned to a much, much lesser degree. Um, and I, I think it's time that we sort of re redress that balance. It would change nothing about the research. It's just in improving the consideration of the issues. So we've seen the effect that humans have on the environment has an impact on animal welfare. We've seen that the things we do in the name of conservation can also have an, an impact on animal welfare. Then there's the third dimension, which um, is that animal welfare as a science, uh, as, a, as a mandated science, as an ethically um, founded science, with its focus particularly on individuals, can inform and refine conservation practice. We heard a lot about this yesterday, and I won't go into any great detail because I have to say, the stuff I learned yesterday taught me that I don't know anything half as much as I think I do on the subject. But the things about cognitive bias, personality, individual variation, stress and emotion, and how they can affect the outcomes of things like reintroduction projects, um, I think that's absolutely critical. And this is where we need a greater dialogue between animal welfare scientists and conservation practitioners and biologists. So just going back, I regard those as, as the three tenets of compassionate conservation. One way, if you're struggling, after all these examples I'm giving, struggling to think about how the two work together, conservation and animal welfare, is to consider the Ethiopian wolf. We're dealing with a population of around 500 of these, uh, 500 individuals left in the world. There are none in captivity. To my knowledge, there never have been, and there, I hope there never will be. Um, when you're down to levels of 500 individuals or less, it starts to become clear that the, the fate of each individual and the welfare of the individual starts to, it becomes absolutely clear that it's critical to the survival of the species. Um, so I always think of the Ethiopian wolf when I think of compassionate conservation. It's partly because it's a project that Born Free's funded for a long time. But um, I hope you can see that that's where Despite all the, you know, in amongst all the noise, you can start to see when you're down to tiny populations, each individual matters. And there's no reason why that concept can't be tracked back up the chain so that each individual does matter, even in non-threatened species. So what is compassionate conservation? It's animal welfare and conservation practice, in a, in a word. It posits that individuals matter and that the well-being of individual animals needs to be factored in when making conservation decisions. Conservation outcomes do not automatically trump the welfare considerations of individuals. That doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that, for example, lethal control isn't sometimes an effective and useful conservation activity, but there are steps along the way that need to be considered before such um, measures are implemented. Compassionate conservation is a framework that fully considers individual animals within conservation research and practice in which the focus historically has been on species, populations and ecosystems. And I think part of the point of this as a new discipline, as a new coming together of fields, is that better animal welfare will lead to better conservation outcomes. And I like to think that it's greater than the sum of its parts, that compassionate conservation isn't just animal welfare plus conservation. There are obstacles we face. I think, you know, just to pick a few handfuls, we're dealing with a, a great range of species um, when we're talking in a conservation context, unlike, a, let's say, a farm animal welfare context. We don't have a great understanding of their basic biology and, anim and, and their needs. And I say that actually even extends into the zoo world. I think it would be a little bit unrealistic to expect that you know everything about the species that you keep in your zoos. There is a misunderstanding still ongoing about animal welfare and animal rights and what the two terms mean. Um, I'm not going to go into that now because we could be here all day, but I think the key point I'm stressing in this is that as, at, at the first point, we're talking about animal welfare, not rights. However, there is a continuum between rights and welfare. Something I call knee-jerk conservation, where historically it's just been, you know, let's, 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 well, we need to, we have a conservation problem, let's dive in and do something, and that something is so often killing something. 
management decisions need to be based on evidence rather than on ecological intuition. And I think that was a really nice phrase that I've came, come across recently. Um, there's also this concept I've encountered where life is tough in the wild, so what does it matter if we take a few animals and do some nasty experiments on them or stick some tags on them or um, hot iron brand them or whatever it might be? Because those individuals might have got predated on anyway. That to me is, an, is, is a, it's illogical. It, it doesn't really make sense. Um, it matters to the individual. But at whatever side of the debate you come at it from, I do think that there is some common ground that harms to wild animals should be minimized wherever and to the extent possible. So where are we with compassionate conservation? Um, I, this is a term that we bandied around within Born Free because we work on animal welfare and conservation uh, for many years. And then we became aware that there were other people, better people than us, considering issues just along these lines. And one of which, uh, were, well, there is the results of which were published in 2010, but I think the workshop took place in 2007 at UBC, was organized by David Fraser, bringing together conservationists and animal welfare scientists uh, and coming up with a consensus statement and guiding principles. It doesn't use the phrase compassionate conservation, but I see it as absolutely, um, absolutely critical in, in developing the thinking to where we are now. Um, Born Free and the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit at Oxford organized a, uh, a symposium on the subject in 2010, and I know at least two people in the audience, three people in the audience that were there, um, I'm proud to say. Uh, Mark Beckoff has published widely on this subject, um, and uh, had indeed a, a book that's subtitled The Case for Compassionate Conservation. The Born Free Foundation funds an award for compassionate conservation, which we'll touch on very briefly if I have a minute. There's a new center for compassionate conservation at the University of Technology in Sydney. And we've established a website, which you're welcome to, to check out. The latest award, the latest Virginia McKenna Award for compassionate conservation, which I, it, this is the first time it's been informally announced, is uh, going to the Mad Dog Initiative, which is um, a new, project designed to control feral dogs in Madagascar, both to protect the, their own welfare, but also to uh, study the effect on biodiversity conservation. And I, I just thought it was such an awesome project that we couldn't give it to anyone else. Um, so what are the benefits of compassionate conservation? A reduction in suffering, at least. At least a more humane conservation approach, but I think it's, new, it's more than that. I really hope it can be a new paradigm, a sort of conservation 2.0, um, where it isn't just conservation plus welfare, it's compassionate conservation. So one final point before I get to the challenge. Um, we have a con uh, conference next year being organized right now. This is the first announcement of the Save the Date in July. And again, it's, this will be uh, co-hosted with the Animal Welfare Program at UBC. Um, make a note in your diaries. Finally, zoos. Zoos increasingly claim a role in conservation and cite conservation as their raison d'etre. Captivity, I think we can acknowledge, captivity presents challenges to ensure adequate welfare. Progressive zoos do work to mitigate potential harms and overcome welfare challenges. But how do we rec reconcile a paradigm that inherently presents welfare challenges but champions conservation under the word compassionate conservation. I don't know, I don't have the answer to this. The only thing I can give you, just as a sort of challenge, is something like this picture. This was taken in at a UK zoo. Um, it's a performance. Somebody yesterday said, I don't know if zoos are still using mammals in performances. Yes, they are. This isn't an aquarium, although it is a marine mammal. It's very much a performance. It's that is a lovely painted backdrop or photographic backdrop. They're actually in a field, a field in Hertfordshire. Um, the point I want to make is that it's, that's the tagline of ZSL, the Zoological Society of London, living conservation. The zoo community, in my opinion, have been very quick to brand almost everything they do as conservation. It's important to re remember that not everything they do, or you do, is conservation, and many things you do are almost the antithesis of conservation. So what I, why I say this as a challenge is when thinking of compassionate conservation, I, the challenge I lay before you as zoo industry professionals is to think long and hard about how you can truly reflect the values of compassionate conservation 
before we see a situation where living conservation in the tagline on the logo is replaced with compassionate conservation. So with that, I just want to say thank you to the Detroit Zoo uh, and to the other people on the slide. And I welcome any questions if there's time. And we do have time for a couple of questions for Chris. Do we have any questions in the audience? We have a question from Keith at the top. Chris, I want to I, I wanna engage in the conversation for one second, because I think there's some values, underlying values, that we need to talk about um, that are not all shared in this room. And I agree with you 100%. We do a lot of field conservation, and, and animal welfare is always one of our pieces. But I want to go back to how I think a lot of us in the conservation field see the world right now. And we basically have come to a realization, whether it's where I work in the Inamira Lagoon or on global scales, that humans have so affected natural habitats that essentially we are going to be managing wildlife in one scale or another in perpetuity. The responsibility never ends. So we have people locally who are very upset. We saved this years ago, and now we have to save it again. It's really a matter of fact that now we are responsible for managing the entire globe. And there's a value proposition there that, that you said about Ethiopian wolves. And you said there's only 500 left. And you said, and I hope they're never in captivity. And that assumes that in captivity, and I'm using the phrase, is by definition a bad case. When sometimes it's just the best available tool. So I would argue, if the way we save Ethiopian wolves is to put them in a breeding situation, get people engaged, hell, if that's part of the solution, it needs to be part of the palette. And here's my value proposition. There's an assumption here that, by definition, animal welfare suffers when they're under our care. That you said that about, I, I never want to see them there, versus, why not? If that's the best way to solve it, and we can do a great job for Ethiopian wolves. And so, Going back a little bit to the discussion earlier about why we're sensitive to criticism, I think that's part of the reason. There's always this underlying assumption that we're the worst case, that we're the last place we want to be. And we don't know that. I was with Jane Goodall last year, and she walked through, um, she mentioned the, um, the chimpanzee exhibit at the Houston Zoo, and she said, you know what? If I was a chimp, I would rather live here than live in the wild. So, and there's many cases. So I just, I raised that. You have to be careful on the flip side. We're all not all bad, we're not all good, but the bottom line is we're part of that solution and I think you can't automatically assume it's a compromise to be under our care or be part of it. So I just wanna raise that issue as something for us to all think about. And I think that's some of our sensitivity to the criticism. They're, they've always assumed it's a compromise for animals to be in zoos or aquarium. I don't necessarily think it is. And there's a lot of animals, if you could ask them and they could talk, they would say, we would be happy to be here. There's a lot of advantages as well, so. Well, there's, there's a very great deal that I'd like to come back on. Um, I didn't detect a question, <laughs> so I, I probably won't, and let's have a chat in the break. Um, don't get me wrong, there's, you know, this, is a, this is not something to discuss in sound bites, however tempting it is. Um, the only thing I will say on captivity versus the wild is remembering the evolutionary biology of the species and the individuals that make up that species. The wild, the, the real wild, the unaltered wild is where I believe those animals should be. Obviously when humans get involved, there's a different dynamic that needs to be involved, but that doesn't mean that welfare needs to be chucked out the window. That's, if it helps clarify, that's what I'm trying to get across.